Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Pete Heuser, president of the City Club. As I was saying, it's been over a month since we met. Some of you joined us uh, a couple of weeks ago to go on the West Side Light Rail uh, tour out to Hillsboro. It was really a lot of fun, and those of you who didn't make it might want to, uh, to do it this weekend. Uh, the cars are clean, uh, the stations are beautiful, and you really get a chance to see uh, the West Side from a vantage point that you don't get from the highway. Uh, City Club members Tom Walsh and Tuck Wilson, who directed the effort, uh, and really thousands of others involved in the West Side Light Rail project are really to be congratulated. It's quite a feat to have gotten it done, and it's really something you need to see. We have with us today Peggy Nagai, who's going to talk to us about the effort to redress the Japanese-American internment during World War II. This program is presented in conjunction with the Smithsonian exhibit, a more perfect union, which is now at the Multnomah County Central Library. Library uh, Director Ginny Cooper will be hosting a special tour for City Club members following the luncheon today. In one week on September 18th, we'll deal with another human rights issue, that of worker rights and corporate responsibility. Our speaker will be Medea Benjamin from Global Exchange, a San Francisco-based organization that monitors labor practices of international corporations. That meeting will, too, be here at the Multnomah Club. Our board host today is Jay Formick. Jay is chair of the research board and executive director of Oregon Heat. He'll, of course, ask the first question of our speaker, and then we'll open it to others in the audience. Normally, we limit the questions to City Club members in the audience, but today the, uh, the luncheon is co-sponsored by a number of different organizations, I think uh, nine or ten different organizations. So whoever is a member of any of those groups, feel free to step up to the mic over here and ask your question. Please give us your name and uh, the group uh, that you're a member of. And you can form the line uh, even before Jay is done with his questions so we can get in as many questions as possible. Uh, please, 30 seconds only and questions, not speeches. We already have one speaker here at the, at the podium. <laughs> We have three new corporate sponsors this quarter. The law firm of Miller, uh, Miller Nash was last month. This month it's Lane Powell Spears Lebersky, uh, Weyerhaeuser Corporation, and CH2M Hill. We're grateful for their support and they make our Friday prog programs possible. There we go. This is a new program we instituted uh, a year ago, a corporate sponsorship of our programs, and we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, Portland corporations really step up and support things that they believe in. We thought we would address the Japanese internment issue today to consider the lessons which can be learned so that history does not repeat itself. We invited Peggy Nagai to come because she is one of the most prominent Northwesterners to be a part of the effort to redress the wrong. She first became involved in this work in 1978 when she was appointed to the National Redress Committee by Dr. James Tujimura of Portland, who was then president of the Japanese American Citizen League. From 1982 until 1987, while she was assistant dean at the University of Oregon Law School, she worked as lead attorney in the case of Yasui versus United States, which reopened one of the decisions against Japanese Americans who violated curfew and evacuation orders during World War II. In 1996, Peggy was appointed by President Clinton to the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund which she has been active in while she has been running her diversity management consulting firm in Eugene, which focuses on valuing diversity, organizational change, and spirit in the workplace. 
But really, ever since she graduated from Vassar and then from Lewis and Clark Law School, Peggy Nagai has been involved in fighting discrimination. She's received awards for her efforts promoting the rights of the indigent, blacks, Native Americans, Asians, and others whose voice needed to be heard. We're fortunate to have her with us today. Let's welcome Peggy Nagai to the City Club. Thank you, and thank all of you. You know, sometimes we have to, in order to step forward, we have to take a step back. For part of my time today, we will take that step back. And as we do that, I'd pose one question to you. If you knew you could not fail, how would you live your life? Minoru Yasui lived such a life back in 1942. Born in Hood River, Oregon, the son of a farmer and a businessman, Yasui was as American as the flag, mother, and apple pie. He graduated from the University of Oregon, ROTC, and Phi Beta Kappa. He went on to the University of Oregon Law School and graduated at the age of 23. He was the first Japanese American member of the Oregon State Bar. In December of 1941, he was working in Chicago. Right after Pearl Harbor happened, he started to make plans to come back to Oregon because he thought he was going to be called up for public for military duty. When he got here, it was a very different situation. His father, a very prominent businessman in Hood River, had been arrested by the FBI and taken to a Department of Justice camp where his family did not know where he was. His family's assets were frozen by the Department of Treasury and his mother was left there to tend to things uh, with his teenage brother, uh, Homer Yasui, who's in the audience today, and a teenage, Homer, raise your hand, <laughs> and, a, and a teenage daughter. The rumors were flying all over the place. There was talk of a military curfew. There was talk of rounding up all the Japanese. But through all of this, Yasui firmly believed in the Constitution, did not believe that the Constitution would uphold curtailing the rights of American citizens. But time marches on, and in February of 1942, President Roosevelt signs Executive Order 9066 that designates military areas and says that the Secretary of War can decide who to include and who to exclude from those areas. The next thing that happens, the Western Defense Command is designated a military area. Oregon, Washington, California, and the southern part of Arizona. The next thing that happens, General John L. DeWitt is named as the commander of that military area. And in March of 1942, Military Proclamation Number 3, General DeWitt says that German aliens, Italian aliens, and all persons of Japanese ancestry must have a curfew imposed on them. Now, what do you think all persons of Japanese ancestry means? What does it mean to you? Well, Yasui knew what it meant. It meant American citizens. He had to take action. He decided to put his legal skills to work. He wanted to find a test case. You know, that all-American soldier from World War I, a family man, somebody who has fought for his country. No one stepped forward, so what did Yasui do? He stepped forward. He became the test case. He walked the streets of Portland, Oregon. He went up to a police officer and said, here, look, uh, this is, uh, you know, I'm Japanese American. It's after 8 o'clock. Please arrest me. The officer said, go home. You're going to get in trouble. Your mother won't like this. Uh, the ultimate test. <laughs> Undetoured, Yasui walked into the Portland police station, said the same thing, you know, curfew, Japanese American, and they arrested him. Little did he realize that he would be spending nine months in solitary confinement in the Multnomah County Jail as his case went before the Federal District Court of Oregon and the United States Supreme Court. Little did he realize he would end up being a convicted a person with a federal arrest record and, convic and conviction. He lost at the federal district court level. He lost at the Supreme Court. To him, the Constitution had failed him. Along with two other defendants, Gordon Hirabayashi in Seattle, who challenged the detention orders, and Fred Korematsu in San Francisco. They all three lost 
Why? The court said it was constitutional to have a curfew, to detain, to remove, and to incarcerate people based on their race. The reason? Military necessity. With those rulings, it made it constitutional to incarcerate 120,000 people for almost four years of their life. They went to camps in places that I've been to since and I wouldn't want to live for a day. They went to the desolate areas of Idaho and Wyoming, Utah, Arizona, Arkansas, and Colorado. 70,000 of those people were American citizens. The others were resident aliens. And why weren't they naturalized citizens? Because the Supreme Court had said that you can't become a citizen unless you're white or you're black. And that, that case was not overturned until 1952. It's the first time when Japanese Americans could become <coughs> naturalized citizens. So imagine with me, you're in this desolate area, and there, as far as the eye can see, there are rows and rows and rows of flimsy tar paper barracks. There are 12,000 people in your camp. You line up to go to the bathroom. What do you find when you get there? A room with a commode and a commode and a commode, but no partitions. When you have to go eat, where do you eat? You eat in a mess hall. You wait in line. There's no privacy. You've got a family of six, and you're living in an unpartitioned barracks that's 20 by 25 feet. Think about it. Not like any summer camp I've been to. And for most people, they spent almost four years of their lives there. That was indeed an incredible time. Fast forward with me, then, to the early 1980s. In the 1980s, Peter Irons, a professor, found a document in the National Archives, a document so hot that in the legal profession, we call it the smoking gun, uh, that had him go to these defendants, these three defendants that were still alive, and say, will you reopen your cases? There are 40 lawyers in California, in Oregon, and in Washington. We reopened their cases, Minya Sui's case in Portland, Oregon, Gordon Hirabayashi's in Seattle, Washington, Fred Korematsu's in San Francisco, California. And I just want to give you a flavor of what it was like to work about seven years pro bono, I might add, for the, those who are cynical about lawyers, uh, <laughs> about the kind of evidence that we saw from the National Archives. I'll give you three different snippets. First one, the official report report from General John L. DeWitt. What he says is, I didn't base my decision uh, of incarceration on military necessity. I based it on race. What he said was, the Japanese race is an enemy race. Doesn't matter where they're born or raised. A Jap is a Jap. And you can't separate out the loyal from the disloyal. That was a hot document. What the government did was they, they had 10 copies of it printed. They got all 10 copies back. They burned nine of them. And they kept one for the National Archives. Good decision. The second document was of uh, an official in the government that said, you know, we can't treat Italian immigrants the same way and as poorly as we're treating Japanese immigrants. Why? Joe DiMaggio is a national hero. And Joe DiMaggio's father is an Italian immigrant. Aren't you impressed at the level of decision making? OK, the last bunch of documents from the Office of Naval Intelligence and the FBI. What they said was, it's unnecessary to have mass incarceration. They said, we've been spying on this, these communities for years now. You know, if there's any problem, if there's, if there's a potential of disruption, we know who to pick up. You don't have to do this. And it was amazing that J. Edgar Hoover was uh, you know, against the incarceration, and he was. So at that time, and in those days, it was quite riveting to be an attorney on these cases. I remember, looking, I remember reading them in law school, and I thought, if there was anything I could do to right this wrong, it would make these three years of torture worthwhile. <laughs> but what can you do? It was before the Supreme Court. The next court is God, and I'm not willing to, to, to argue in that jurisdiction quite yet. Um, and so for me, it was really the thrill of a lifetime to represent Minoru Yasui. And I'll tell you, one of the most riveting parts of the, of the litigation uh, was in the Hirabayashi trial in Seattle, where the then government attorney, Victor Stone, argued as though Pearl Harbor happened yesterday. I was stunned. 
This is in the 1980s, and it felt like this could happen again. Oh, yes, it could happen again. And on the other hand, the government attorney who wrote the brief to the Supreme Court in 1943, Edward Ennis, reversed his position from 40 years ago and testified for our side. What did he say? He said that we withheld favorable evidence from those defendants <coughs> intentionally and that we altered material evidence to the Supreme Court. He said essentially we lied to the United States Supreme Court. Mr. Ennis, can you imagine holding that secret for 40 some years? He died shortly after that trial. I think the saddest part of all the cases was that Minoru Yasui died before his case was totally complete. And he said at the beginning, he said, you know, Peggy, I don't know if we're going to win, but we're going to give him hell. And up until the day that he died, he was a fighter, he was a warrior, he was really my definition of a hero. Yasui was also instrumental in obtaining redress from Congress, and he wasn't alive when President Reagan signed, and I'm going to cry, signed the bill in 1988, the Civil Liberties Public Education Act. He died two years before then. Okay, so some people would say, why talk about this? What's the relevancy of this in 1988 in Portland, Oregon? I say that there's a relevancy because of this, that there's a pattern in our history and the history around the world of what happens when a group of people are singled out and penalized, not on the basis of what they've done, but on the basis of who they are. So let me give you some examples. Go back before the Japanese when the Chinese were in this country. They came over here because of business interests, the railroads and mining companies that wanted them here. They were cheap labor, they worked in the, in the railroads and in the mines, they were despised by other workers, they were lynched in places like Oregon and other parts of this country, and finally they were barred from any immigration in 1882 by Congress. Okay, you say that's a long time ago, Peggy. How about the late 70s and the early 80s? And for many of us in that audience, that wasn't that long ago. The US hostages in Iran. I remember I was practicing law in Portland, and there was, there was a, um, a rumor going around that this government, our government, wanted to pick up all the Iranian students in the United States who were out of status. And guess what? Round them up and put them where? In Department of Justice camps, those same camps. Remember when the public first became aware of AIDS and the HIV virus? There also was a hue and cry from parts of the government to round up gay people who were HIV positive and put them in those camps. Where's the logic in this? It'd be like rounding up people who had chicken pox and putting them into camps. And let's come back to Oregon in 1998. The legislature passed a bill that said that if a police officer reasonably, reasonably suspected somebody of committing a crime or somebody was about to commit a crime, that they could stop that person and ask questions about that person. Now let me ask you this. What does a person look like when they're about to commit a crime? Is it the car they drive? Is it the clothes they wear? Is it their age? Is it their skin color? What about the civil rights of drivers being free of fear to drive down the street and not be stopped based on an immutable characteristic? That's called race profiling. And in other states, in Marion County, they're calling this uh, law driving while Hispanic. And in Portland, they're calling it driving while Asian or driving while black. It's called race profiling in other places. And in New Jersey of this year, a judge did a survey on, he wanted to know who are the New Jersey state troopers stopping? Who are they stopping? And what he found was that black drivers are stopped almost five times more than non-black drivers. The logical conclusion, selective enforcement, based on what? Based on race. I believe that if any group is singled out on the basis of who they are, not what they've done, that that's wrong. It's wrong to impose a curfew 
based on race. It's wrong to think about rounding up people based on sexual orientation. It's wrong to strip people of their homes and their livelihood based on race. And you know what? We can stand here, I can stand here and talk about it. We can talk about it as a group. But really, what this comes down to is the individual level. On an individual level, what can we do? And I believe there are things that we can do that if we individually were willing to commit to, we, have a we stand a fighting chance that history does not repeat itself. There are three lessons that I learned from, from my parents who were incarcerated, who are in the audience today, and from representing Minoru Yasui. Lesson number one is speak out if someone's being devalued or marginalized. And I had a good dose of this when I was at Harvard one summer. Summer of 1984, I was at the Harvard Institute for Educational Management. Um, there was a group of about 100 of us, presidents, vice presidents, provosts from universities around the country. And one day, there's a professor from the business school. And he was telling us the latest marketing techniques. And, and uh, you know, I was doing my usual student thing. It was a lecture hall, and I was sort of halfway up the lecture hall, kind of slumped over, taking notes, probably half asleep. And he said, he used the term Jap products. Uh, everything went through my mind in seconds. It was like life went into slow motion and rapid motion at the same time. I thought, he didn't say that thing. He didn't say that. No, he didn't say it. Yes, he did say that. Is anyone going to speak out? Someone must be going to speak out. The director of the program is going to speak out. He's in the audience. Anyone going to speak out? Am I going to speak out? I was the only Asian American out of the 100. So what I said to him is, please don't use that word. That's inappropriate. He sort of looks, squints up, tries to find where that voice was in the void. And then he says to me, he says, my clients are Sony and Panasonic and Toshiba. <laughs> and in the breach, without saying it, he said it. What he said was, these are my clients, and I can darn well call them whatever I want to. And who are you as a peon to tell me otherwise? I was stunned. Of course, I thought he'd take my feedback you know, in a professional manner. <gasps> And I was also stunned because no one said anything else. The director didn't say anything to me at the break. None of my classmates said anything to me. About three days later, you know, I've got smoke rolling out of my ears. And I finally go up to the director and say, you know, I don't appreciate, and I've been upset about this for three days. And in the course of our conversation, he called me arrogant. He called me disrespectful. And I learned a valuable lesson then. I learned that if you're going to speak up, you may not win a popularity contest, but you really do exercise that muscle of choice. Do I choose to live a life worthy of who I am? And uh, I, I called back to Derek Bell, who was the dean, and I told him what happened. He says, great, you've got to do what's right, regardless of the personal cost. Don't ever expect a job offer from Harvard, however. <laughs> <laughs> There have been other moments, I'm sure there have been other moments for you when you've had choice points. I remember I was at an Oregon State Bar Affirmative Action Committee meeting, and this wasn't about race. We were talking about gay rights, and one of the members of the committee said, you know, that's not our issue. That's somebody else's issue. And I thought for a moment, and I said, you know, I'd ask you to reconsider for two reasons. One, because I know that there are attorneys of color and students of color who are gay and who are lesbian. And two, I'd ask you to remember what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. What he said was, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so you and I have these choice points. And the question is, are we going to speak out? Lesson number two, get beyond your fear and get to know people who are different from yourself. I learned that in law school. I had a best friend who was African American. And Phyllis and I, we were buddies. You know, we did everything together. We studied together. We went to class together. And I'll tell you, I was pretty ignorant about African Americans. I grew up in boring Oregon. You all know where boring is, right? I said that to somebody the other day. They said, Aren't there, isn't the audience going to be insulted for calling Oregon boring? I said, no, no, that's the name of the town I grew up in. <laughs> OK, so I grew up in boring. I didn't grow up around any African Americans. I tell you, I was still pretty ignorant in law school. You know, there were thoughts that went through my, my mind, like, 
What's her hair like? What does she use to, on her hair? What, what does she eat? What about interracial dating? You know, all those inappropriate questions. Um, and yet, I wanted to know. And I, I thought about this a long time. And then one day I said, oh, heck, I'm just going to, Phyllis, can I ask you some ignorant questions? She goes, well, I'm not sure. Uh, and I started to ask her the questions. And she started to respond. And actually what it did was it opened up the space for dialogue. She then began to open and ask questions about what it's like to be Asian American. And you know the things that we learn from one another, you can't learn from textbooks on race and culture. They're the things that you learn from relationship, from dialogue, from getting to know each other. And I'm reminded of another situation where people got beyond their fear to get to know other people. Um, anybody know about Camp Odyssey, a camp for teenagers in the state of Oregon? Yeah, I know, at least John knows. Um, well, I volunteered at that camp for several years. And one year, I was head of logistics. And on my team were none other than bank presidents from a local bank. Mostly, they were all white and male. And these guys, for a week, uh, lived in a rat-infested cabin and took down chairs and put up chairs, scraped dishes and cleaned the cafeteria, went on night duty. And I could see from their conversations that in order for them to learn about diversity, because they were with 120 teenagers, imagine that, of uh, different races and backgrounds from the state of Oregon, they really had to get beyond their professional status and position to learn. There was one guy that said, you know, I was working next to this teenager that had a pierced nose and a pierced ear and a pierced everywhere and tattoos. And in order to learn, I needed to get beyond my own fear of being called a racist or a sexist or an ageist or whatever else. And I had the privilege of hearing one of those presidents talk the other day. And he said, the reason I support diversity today, the reason why I have a strategic diversity plan is in large part because of my experience at Cap Odyssey with those kids. He got beyond his fear. The third lesson and the final one that I'll, I'll offer for you today has to do about leadership. It's my firm belief that within each of us, we are leaders. We may not have been officially appointed a leader. We may not see ourselves necessarily always as a leader. But I know, and I'll, I'll just dub you with my magic wand, you're all leaders. And, and the question is, as leaders, will you step forward in your sphere of influence? There are. I, I remember, and I'm sure you remember, the newspaper article about James Byrd Jr., the African-American in Jasper, Texas, who was chained and drugged behind that truck. And I often wonder, would that horrific death not have had to happen if someone had spoken up and exerted their leadership, not a government official, but a colleague, not a police officer, but a friend. If somebody had said, we will not tolerate this. And there have been many people who have stepped up to the leadership plate. There's one participant in one of my diversity sessions, 55-year-old white male. And he admitted, you know, he said, I've heard lots of racial jokes in the time I've worked with these guys, 30 years. They worked outdoors, manual labor. And what he said was, they didn't come home to me until my granddaughter, my daughter, married an African American. And she had a baby. And now I have a granddaughter that's half black and half white. Those jokes have a different impact. They're talking about my family now. And he said, I thought long and hard about this. And I finally went up to these guys and said, could you please not tell those racial jokes in my presence? That takes a lot of courage for someone who's been working with other people for that long. The last example I have is about Derek Bell. Derek was a dean, uh, and he hired me as his assistant dean. And there was an opportunity for a faculty hiring. There were 600 applicants, three finalists, number one and number three had dropped out. So the logical conclusion was that number two would be hired. There was a faculty meeting. And the number two person was an Asian American woman from San Francisco. And several faculty members said, you know, she's really not qualified. 
She only got to number two because of affirmative action. Never mind that she had nine other job offers from nine other law schools, that she graduated top 10% of her class, that she was published in the Yale Law Journal, that she worked for the largest law firm in the country, and that she taught at Hastings Law School. Somehow, she was unqualified. And at the end of that discussion, Derek said, I will abide by your decision, but I cannot represent an institution that would do this. I resign as dean. He had no idea walking into that meeting that that would happen. He just assumed that she would be hired. And so what he did and what he always said to me is, you've got to do what's right regardless of the personal cost. And that's what he did. And so really what this comes down to, what all of this comes down to, <laughs> is really not about people like me preaching about this issue. It's really whether or not we make forward movement depends on individuals like you, like each of us, making a choice and making a decision to act. And oh, heck, I'm going to say it too. You know, people ask me, why speak out? And I say, do it for justice. Do it for fairness. Do it so that history doesn't repeat itself. At least do it because the next time it might be your child, your family, your relatives. And I say, some people might roll their eyes, do it for love and do it for community. Do it for a sense of what it's like to be authentic, to live a life that's worthy of who you are. At its freest, at its most important level, do it for community and interdependence. And do it for unconditional love. I know, unconditional love is sort of a tacky term. And we might have problems in it, even in our most significant relationships. And I'm talking about unconditional love in this country and in this world. I think it's possible. It's only possible, however, if, you're, if you and I individually are willing to commit, are willing to do one of the lessons, either speak out when somebody's devalued or marginalized, or get beyond your fears and get to know somebody who's different from yourself. Or three, claim your leadership and exert influence on those around you. Will you, will I, in those moments, make that choice? In the words of Gandhi, become the world, become the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you. Well, Peggy, thank you very much for a, a forceful and instructive speech. Um, Minori Yasui was your hero. I dare say you are a hero yourself uh, amongst us today. Um, the first question uh, I wanted to ask you uh, had to do with your reflections on the movement in California to roll back affirmative action. And I've tried to narrow it down to something more specific, but I think I'm going to leave it in general terms. If you could just share with us any reflections you have on a movement uh, that seems hell-bent on rolling back some of the uh, uh, progressive uh, forward motion that you've been uh, extolling. How many days do you have, Jay? <laughs> <clears throat> Affirmative action is a topic that I've spoken on a lot. And, um, you know, the history of affirmative action is that it was, it was instituted as a temporary measure until organizations would create a level of playing field, especially in hiring. And the reason why affirmative action was formed was really to counterbalance what some other uh, organization called the FBI system of employment you know, friends, brothers, and in-laws. And so I often ask people, when will that, the FBI form of employment uh, become null and void? What do you think? When will it become extinct? Uh-huh, about that time. <laughs> and affirmative action was a counterbalance to that. Um, and it's, it's really sad for me to see that people don't understand the reasons for affirmative action. 
Um, so many people think it's about hiring unqualified minorities, rather than there are a lot of qualified people who have never had the opportunity. So I'm sad, and uh, also, in terms of Asian Americans, because there have been some Asian Americans that have said, we really, we really don't believe in affirmative action because we get there on our own merit. And what I say to them is learn your history. Learn your history and learn your history because it is indeed repeating itself. $100 for an Audivox mobile video package. $70 towards a deck and CD changer package. Here's a 141 Sony AM FM CD player for just $149.95. Charlie Davis member. Uh, could you bring us up to date, I suppose, is, uh, inform us where uh, the Coram Nobis cases left off? What did it leave us with? Uh, I guess we have a sense that we have cured the evils of, uh, of uh, evacuation and internment of American-style concentration camps. And I'm anxious that uh, that isn't true, that the Corbin Nobis cases did not erase that experience for us. Yeah, you're right, Charlie. Didn't erase the experience because we didn't bring it before the Supreme Court. So while the underpinnings of the Supreme Court decisions have been gutted, the actual cases themselves still stand. And uh, at the time, we thought about bringing something before the, the Supreme Court, but we looked at the composition of the court, and we had a lot of legal advisors, and we decided not to move forward on it. So it could happen again. There are many people who, who don't believe that set, and it, maybe it won't happen to the Japanese Americans, but those cases still stand. Even though we reversed every conviction, we reversed Yasui's conviction and Hirabayashi's conviction and Korematsu's conviction. Andy Lenahan, uh, City Club member, I'd be curious about what you think are the current most pressing challenges in civil rights in Oregon. Well, repealing that law, um, <clears throat> You know, that's really a, a difficult one for me to answer. Uh, but I would say in general this. I spent nine years or eight years in Seattle. And when I came back to Oregon, what I noticed was that there are not many, there's not much diversity in, in the highest ranks and positions, judges, city councils uh, in this state. And I juxtapose that to the history of the state of Oregon. You know, Oregon was founded as a white homeland. And in the territorial constitution, it excluded African Americans uh, from living in Oregon. We have a history here. We have a history there that's pretty deep in our roots that has to do with race. And so what I would say is, in addition to whatever is going on, I, I think the OCA is quieted down. Is that, is that right? Uh, it's, no, okay. They filed again. They filed again. Well, okay. So that, it, it really made a difference to actually to have the OCA come on the scene for this reason. People could not avoid the issue. They had to start talking about <coughs> civil rights. Not special rights, but civil rights. So the OCA, that, that, uh, law you know there's been there was a article in the Oregon State Bar a long time ago about driving down I-5 and it was called driving while Hispanic and I know personally I've been stopped many times in southern Oregon because I was with a group of minorities uh, the cop even told me that so uh, there are things that happen large civil rights issues I think that there are everyday civil rights issues yes Ruth Curry member um, in regard to these comments uh, that you just made, how would you like to see the Oregon educational system uh, work to, to uh, spread the word on, on this? Um, thanks, that's a great question. Because the, the uh, Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, we in, from 96 to 98, we're now um, defunct, um, spent a lot of money on curriculum projects so that, you know, we need to learn these lessons pretty early on. And if the textbooks said what they said, uh, what my textbook said in the seventh grade was that the Japanese Americans were incarcerated for their own protection. It's a hard lesson, hard, hard lesson to hear when your parents and grandparents and all your relatives were incarcerated. 
So, you know, let's tell the truth, but let's say, say it at a young age. The other thing that I think is important for education is to teach the language of caring. To teach the language of caring so that we can care about one another and respect and value each other's differences. That's also what can be done, both with teachers and with textbooks. And uh, to me, it's leadership by exampleship from teachers. Judy Nichols, City Club member. We've spoken about the uh, conflicts that happen in terms of what goes on with race and gender. Could you comment about what's going on in terms of what I'm seeing as a tension in ages? Ah, oh, yes. Um, since I'm of one of those generations, uh, there are a lot of workplaces that I go to where, you know, people say, what are those younger people doing? Uh, you know, we had a sense of values and we had a sense of this and that. And I just have to remind them, these are the people we asked for. <laughs> these are our children. <laughs> Remember, we wanted people who were pretty independent. Uh, and did what, they, you know, did what they wanted to do, in a sense, could think for their own selves, and here we've got them. It's kind of like, be careful what you ask for, because you might get them. And so Generation X, uh, and I don't say that derogatorily, uh, are what we ask for in many, many ways. The question is, we don't recognize the value that we have to one another. Um, and as an aging boomer myself, uh, I, I have my own challenge about that. You know, I was waiting till the time where I got old enough so people would respect me based on my age. And then I go into these training sessions with 20-year-olds, and uh, it's just not the same world. And the question is, am I going to change with it or not? Uh, so I, I really appreciate that tension. Thanks. Uh, I got here a little bit late. Uh, Joella Whirling, club member, would you comment on uh, the role and the action of the American Civil Liberties Union during uh, the struggles um, of the Japanese Americans? Um, are you referring to uh, the Northern California chapter of the ACLU? Uh, I don't really have enough background to, to say whether I'm specifically referring to that chapter, uh, but it's never been clear to me what role the ACLU did play in that period. Mm -hmm. The Northern California chapter of the ACLU supported Fred Korematsu, and they did it um, they did it knowing that the National wanted to uh, sever them as a chapter. They took a huge stand. Um, I, I'm, I can't necessarily say that for the rest of the ACLU, however, that really was not supportive of bringing these test cases. So their role was pretty limited. I'm Jack Butler, a member of the City Club. In 1952, I read a book which markedly turned around my life and gave me the direction I have followed since then. The name of the book was The Governing of Men by mm -hmm. Alexander Layton. Now Alexander Layton was both a social psychiatrist and an anthropologist. He wrote about the relocation of the Japanese into the post in Arizona camp. Mm -hmm. The first part of the book was all about that. The second part was his theory that would make a difference. I'm just wondering, can you tell us, are there any current books that would help people turn their lives around? Hmm. What should we read yeah. now? Oh, now that gives me wide range. Um, <laughs> um, I would suggest reading a book, One Day My Soul Opened Up. Uh, there are lots of books. There are certainly lots of books on the incarceration and imprisonment of Japanese Americans. But where I guess where I'm going is that we all need healing. And that's where my work is going, healing in the workplace. And so the books that I'm reading are books on mind, body, spirit, and what it means to bring your whole self to work. What it means to have authenticity and a, a freedom of who you are. Um, so there are, I'd be happy to talk to you. I, I just uh, had an order for about 10 books, and they're all on leadership, and they're all, they're all on what is it like to discover the leadership within each one of us, and they're Josie Bass books. 
Um, but my favorite book right now is One Day My Soul Opened Up. Shall I use this one? Hello, I'm Bill Crane. I'm a City Club member. I'd like to follow up on Andy Linehan's question about pressing civil rights issues. Civil rights are protected in the United States and most of all in Oregon by law. We live in a nation under law. There's a big group of Oregonians who have no protection in uh, employment and housing and all of that thing, gay and lesbian people, as you've acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put you on the spot and pretend that you're a legislator. You're fresh into the Senate. We'll make you a senator. All right, um, more power. I like it. Okay. <laughs> okay. What would be the most pressing things that we can do? The end of law, should we allow gay marriage? Um, what about inheritance things, estate? things, all of that. What do you see as the most important things for the next legislature to do to protect the civil rights of gay people? Well, being a politician, I would try to dodge it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of my best friends are politicians. Uh, but I think in terms of basic civil rights, not special rights, in terms of housing, in terms of employment, uh, in terms of medical benefits, um, I, I don't, I'm not marriage would be fine with me. I'm not sure about inheritance because I didn't do any estate planning work. But, you know, my belief is, as I said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And uh, I thought about running for office. I thought I could be elected, but I wasn't sure I could get reelected. And in large part because I really would feel the need to speak out on those issues. And I'm not sure I could compromise well on those issues. So one of the hardest areas of the diversity work that I do has to do with sexual orientation. And people have called it anything from abominable to unnatural. But I loved this one workplace where they said, you know, adultery is uh, against God's, laws, God's law as well. And I'd ask you, in this workplace, if we refused to work with people who committed adultery, how large would our workforce be? <laughs> and somebody said, very small. So I appreciate people's beliefs and their rights, but I'm talking about the ability to, be, to work, to live, to have medical benefits, to be with somebody you love. Those are basic human rights in a country that was founded on basic human rights. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm sorry, Peggy, there was one other topic that hadn't come up that I hoped would come up, and I've got a question for you on it. In the last 15 or 20 years in Oregon and in the Northwest, we've seen companies coming over here from Asia. I know SEH, Korematsu, some others. Um, Komatsu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mix them up with Fred. <laughs> it, and uh, I'm wondering whether that's changed the relationships, um, uh, relations, whether there's resentment or whether that's been, had a positive effect upon uh, relations with uh, Asians here in America and in the <laughs> Northwest. That's my father sneeze. Um, you know, Pete, that's a good question because I remember in. Um, the 80s, uh, the cover of Time and Newsweek, how the Japanese are invading the United States. Remember those slogans? When they were buying up companies, Japanese companies were coming over here and buying it up. Never mind that um, the foreign country that uh, held the most, I think, holdings in the US was a European country, England or whatever. I think it was Canada, actually. Um, I think. Things will not change unless we get to know each other better. You see, it's so easy. Just look out in this audience. It's so easy to be segregated, isn't it? By, by gender, all of you guys right here. Uh, <laughs> but certainly by uh, age, by race. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying anything that doesn't happen to me, to you. It's easy for us to live in our separate worlds. And until we actually get to know people who are different from ourselves, I think we hold stereotypes. You know, and everybody holds stereotypes. Morris Massey said that we have our core values from the age of 10. Think back to where you were at the age of 10. Where were you? 
In the gutters of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Okay. <laughs> he was in the gutters of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Okay. I was in Boring, Oregon. And unless we have significant emotional events happen, we retain those core values. And I would say what I learned at 10 in Boring, Oregon, with not much diversity, is not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. I mean, I learned eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and it wasn't catch a tiger by the toe. I learned lots of things really at the core of who I am that unless I'm willing to move beyond my fear and get to know people, they remain with me. So we can have employers from Japan, we can have uh, lots of things happening, but it's not gonna change the, the humanity unless we can do some very simple things, Pete. Thank you very much, Peggy. It's really interesting. Um, I mentioned before we started that uh, Ginny Cooper, the library, would uh, host us at the library, or at least host City Club members. Of course, uh, anyone here can attend. We'd uh, love to have you. She says she'll be walking over to the library from here, or you can take the light rail, but it'll be good time to get a private tour of this exhibit. Well, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're adjourned.